Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Sandy Grant, and it's my privilege to serve here as the Dean of Sydney uh, on the ministry staff at St Andrew's Cathedral, and you're very welcome tonight. It's so lovely to see you here for uh, one of these special diocesan occasions where churches across the diocese come together uh, with friends and family uh, as we set aside these pastors for the next stage of their ministry and uh, throughout their life. A couple of things that will help our service run smoothly. Firstly, the ever-present need to remind you to switch your phones to the silent mode or perhaps better still, off altogether. The Bible is printed in the order of service tonight, so unless you're checking up on our preacher in your Greek New Testament on the phone or something, you probably don't need it. Uh, we uh, prefer not to have photographs going all through the service. Um, we leave that to your um, uh, wisdom and responsibility. Uh, I think those who are here as children often are either family of the ordinands or close friends, and so they'll be very interested in what's going on with their loved one. But we have supplied uh, children's packs just in case there are any moments where it's slightly helpful to be distracted. There are bathrooms. Uh, there is a, a cry room over off the town hall doors, the, the north doors. And uh, Chris, have we checked that the television screen's on? And there's an audio feed in there, and there are some toys if uh, someone wants to take younger children there. Toilets are off the north door. Or at the rear, go down the stairs and to the left, and you'll find toilets down there as well. Uh, the other thing to say is that any who are ordained as presbyters in the Anglican Church of Australia uh, and would like to lay hands on the ordinance at the time of ordination, you'll be invited to come forward. It may be helpful if you're intending to come forward to be towards the end of your aisle if that's easily arranged in the next minute or so before we're ready to start. Um, but that's, uh, again, I leave that to your discretion. Uh, I think that's probably about all I can think of that needs to be said. In a few moments, my colleague Chris will ask you all to stand uh, as the clergy process on in. Thank you for coming.
Lord be with you. You may be seated. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Before I pray, acknowledging uh, God's gift of the land originally to the original inhabitants of Australia, uh, I can pass on personal greetings from the Reverend Michael Duckett, newly ordained as a presbyter himself, uh, and the chair of our Sydney Anglican Indigenous People Ministry Committee. And he says, sincere thanks to God for raising up those willing to answer the call to serve as presbyters. May God richly bless you and keep you all as you faithfully serve the great I am. And uh, Michael kindly took my call uh, today in the middle of holidays, uh, which are very nice of him, so that we could pass those greetings on. So let's bow our heads. Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the creator of all that is. We acknowledge that in your providence you gave custodianship of the land upon which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. We acknowledge with sorrow the painful history between the Aboriginal people and the latest settlers of this land. And we pray that you may work between us the reconciliation that is the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Archbishop, I present these men, Timothy, Malcolm, Roger, Alan and Daniel, to be admitted to the Order of Presbyter. Take care that those you present are, by their learning and godly way of life, suitable to exercise their ministry to the honour of God and the building up of his church. I have inquired concerning them they have been examined, and I believe them to be fit for this office. Good people, these are the candidates whom we propose, God willing, to receive this day into the holy office of Presbyter. For after due examination, I find that they are lawfully called to this function and ministry, and that they are persons fit for this office. However, if you know of any obstacle or notorious offence in any of these men, such as would bar him from being received into this holy ministry, come forward in the name of God and reveal what the offence or obstacle is. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I commend these men to your prayers. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Again we pray, Almighty God, giver of all that is good, by your Holy Spirit, you have appointed various orders of ministry in your church. 
Look in mercy on these your servants, now called to the office of presbyter. So fill them with the truth of your doctrine and clothe them with holiness of life, that they may faithfully minister to the glory of your name and the benefit of your church. We ask this through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our readers come forward, please attend to the Lord's word. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. But to each of what, one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does his, he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 
gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, starting at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the tent heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first to mark must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good evening, everybody. My name is Gary. I have the great privilege of being the Bishop of Western Sydney, from which both 2022 NRL grand finalists came from, not to make a point of that. And I also have the great privilege of sharing God's word with you this evening. Uh, please join me in prayer, with me in prayer as, as we come to God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who speaks and we pray that you'll be with us tonight as you speak so we would understand and love the Lord Jesus more and more. We pray this in his great name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the gospel reading and I want to start by saying this, uh, that the world is full of leadership books. There's lots and lots of leadership books. Every Everywhere you look, there's leadership books, the first 90 days, start with why, good to great, the seven habits of highly effective people, there's lots and lots of books. And the reason why there are so many of these books is pretty obvious, isn't it? It's because people want to know how they can be a better leader. Because being a better leader is good for those you lead. And being a better leader is good for achieving the objects that your group has agreed upon. And being a better leader is good for you as well, especially if you're that type of leader who wants to climb the ladder. And what we're, what we're doing here tonight may seem from a certain perspective to be an exercise in progression and ladder climbing. I hope you'll see things differently uh, when we look at the Bible. That when it comes to Christian leadership, it's a little bit different. Why and how? Well, let's have a look. And uh, if you go to the Bible passage of the Gospel reading, uh, starting in verse 35, which uh, comes from Mark's account of the life of Jesus, uh, our passage starts with an outrageous request from two of his disciples. James and John, two of his inner ring of followers, come up to Jesus and say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we are. Now, I don't know if anyone said that to you before. Uh, a friend, for those of you with parents, maybe your child. I mean, how would you feel? How would you feel if someone just came up to you and said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask? It's such a loaded question, isn't it? And you'd be right to be suspicious. And what's the very first thing that you'd say in response? What do you want me to do for you? That's the right answer, isn't it? And, and that's what Jesus says in verse 36. And now James and John come out with what they actually want. And in many ways, what they are asking is even more outrageous. Because if you have a look in verse 37, they say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, what is this about? Uh, let me explain. I mean, the whole idea of sitting and the right and the left of someone is the idea of sitting in a place of honour. It's a bit like sitting at the uh, bridal table uh, at a wedding. It's that type of idea. And when it came to sitting next to someone really important, like a ruler or a king, it was only the most trusted and therefore most powerful who would be granted those positions. 
So what James and John are actually asking Jesus for here is for privilege and power. They wanted to be right beside Jesus when he came into his glory. And what's that about? Well, a few chapters earlier, Jesus' disciples finally realised who he actually was. And back in chapter 8, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And the disciples replied, well, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. I mean, people had all sorts of ideas when it came to the identity of Jesus, and that's no different today, is it? I mean, people have all sorts of ideas when it comes to Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh, he was a great teacher. He was a holy man. He was a, a revolutionary. I mean, did he even exist? But then Jesus asks his disciples, that's what the people say, but how about you? How about you? Who do you say I am? And in the moment of inspiration, uh, Peter, one of his disciples, gets it right. And he says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, God's promised king. The king that God had promised to reverse the fortunes of his people. The king that God had promised to save his people from their sins and judgment. And this is why James and John have now asked to sit next to Jesus at his right and his left because they knew that Jesus has come to be God's promised king. And they wanted to use their relationship with Jesus for their own personal advantage. They wanted to climb the ladder and make a name for themselves. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, they're real pieces of work, aren't they? I mean, using their friendship with Jesus to further their own personal ambition. They're terrible people. But, you know, that's not the worst of it. Actually, what, what's even worse is actually in, the, in their outrageous request, they've got it totally wrong. They've got it totally wrong about Jesus and what it means for him to be king. And that's why Jesus goes on to say what he does in verse 38. He says, you don't know what you're asking. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Can you drink the cup I drink? Or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? I mean, do you really understand what it is that you're asking for? Says Jesus. But blinded by ambition, they say, yeah, yes, Jesus, we can. We, we can do all of that. We can drink that cup. We can be baptised with that baptism. We can do anything. Just let us sit at your right and left. And Jesus says somewhat ominously, well, one day you will. And it might not be what you expected. And when it comes to what you're asking for, actually, sitting at my right and my left, well, uh, when I come into my glory, who gets to do that has been prepared in advance. And it's all very cryptic at this point. And Jesus doesn't go out of his way to explain it, though it does become clearer as you read on, and we will get to that. But at this point, James and John's outrageous request is turned down by Jesus. And then the news of their request gets to the other ten disciples. And I don't know how they found out. Maybe they saw it on Facebook, I don't know, Twitter, no. whatever. But whatever the case, uh, Mark then says that when the disciples heard of James and John's request, they were indignant, which is a fancy way of saying they were cheesed off, right? They, and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're probably indignant, not because of what had been asked of from Jesus. They're probably indignant because they didn't get in first. That James and John had got in before them. So here you have Jesus in a ring of followers, all fighting each other to sit at his right and his left. And this leads to Jesus gathering his disciples in verse 42 and us coming to the major takeaway when it comes to the nature of Christian leadership. And if you have a look at verse 42, Jesus says to his squabbling disciples, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. You know that's the way leadership normally works. That's the way power works. I was at a dinner last year with uh, a state governor. And uh, I can't remember everything she said, but I do remember that uh, everywhere she went, she was accompanied by her personal attaché. And her personal attaché was a very impressive looking man in full military uniform. He looked like a man that you would not mess with. And I'm sure that if the governor came into danger, he would have kept her safe. 
But do you know what his chief role was that night? It was to carry a folder with her notes. <laughs> so when she got up to speak, here you go, Governor. When she got down, thank you, Governor. That's all he did. He was so impressive. That's all he did. But, you know, that's the nature of power. That's the nature of leadership. Uh, it's the way leadership works in our world where the lesser serves the greater. It's not the other way around. But what Jesus goes on to say in verse 43 is, not so with you. Not so with you. That when it comes to leadership, Jesus style, Christian leadership, things such as status and privilege and power and authority and rank and seniority aren't at the centre. Instead, Jesus says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And by saying this, Jesus turns most people's thinking about leadership, and especially that of his disciples, upside down. He turns it on its head by saying that leadership isn't about being great or first, or being over people, or sitting at the right or the left. Rather, that Christian leadership is about being a servant and putting others first and being a slave of all. And friends, this is true for all Christian leaders. Uh, it is true of Sunday school teachers. It is true of those leading small groups, wardens, parish councillors, rectors, ministers. It's even true of our esteemed archbishop. And it's true for the men being ordained as well. It doesn't matter who you are or which, in which context you are leading. A Christian leader is called to be a servant and to put the needs of those they're leading before their own. Which is why it's also always so disappointing and tragic when we see the opposite. When we see those in Christian leadership misuse their power or exercise their authority in a selfish manner or make everything about them and have themselves at the centre rather than being a servant and a slave of all. And I know in a group like this that some of us may have experienced this personally or been greatly hurt by this type of leadership. And can I just say at this point, it, it's actually not on. It's not on. It shouldn't be like this. It's not what Jesus wants. It's not what you'll find in God's word in the Bible. And if this has been your experience, and it's turned you off to Jesus and Christianity, then not only am I sorry, because you shouldn't have experienced this, but I also want to encourage you, if you are able to, to have another look. Have another look. Because notice what Jesus does. Jesus condemns that type of leadership. Not so with you is what Jesus says. Jesus says to his disciples, you need to be different. You need to be different when it comes to leadership. And what Jesus says is more than just talk, is more than just a suggestion or helpful advice. Because have a look at what he goes on to say in verse 45. Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And what Jesus is saying here is, I'm asking you to do this. There's not something... I'm unwilling to do myself. In fact, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Because what Jesus is saying in verse 45 is, look, I know who I am. I know I'm God's promised king. I know I'm the one that God promised to send to his people to save them. And even though I also know that all things were made by me and for me, that I'm more than just a man or a teacher or a revolutionary or anything like that, but I'm God as well, and even though, that being the case, I should be served and receive all praise and glory and honour and power, I have not come to be served. But I've come to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. What I'm asking you to do as leaders, my disciples, is to follow in my footsteps as I serve. And what Jesus is saying here is actually breathtakingly radical because what does being a servant mean for Jesus? It means Jesus as God 
being willing to give up his life. By not only becoming a human and coming to live with us and then being unjustly convicted and nailed to a cross with two other criminals at his right and his left. Please note that, at his right and his left. You see what he was saying to James and John earlier? With a sign over his head saying, the king of the Jews. That's not all. He gives up his life for you and me as our king in the ultimate act of service and and in the ultimate expression of his type of leadership, giving up his life as a ransom, as a payment to free us from captivity. Giving up, up, giving up his life for ours. Providing us his innocence. So that we who face judgment for our sins can be forgiven and set free. And become members of God's family. Knowing God as our father. With heaven as our home. And the certainty that comes with that. that what, that's what it means for Jesus to be king. And that's what it means for Jesus to be a leader. It means willing self-sacrifice for the sake of others. It means becoming a servant and a slave of all. And can I just say that this type of leadership actually works? Uh, Not only from uh, my own personal experience, but from research as well. And uh, in one of the books I mentioned earlier, Good to Great, by a fellow called Jim Collins, what he did was he looked at elite companies that went from good to great and were able to sustain that for a period of at least 15 years. And the one thing he found in common with these companies was what he called level five leaders. And level five leaders are those who blend extreme personal humility with intense professional will. These are leaders who are more concerned about the success of those around them and the good of their company than their own profile or progression or climbing the ladder. And that's not far away from what Jesus is saying here to the disciples in Mark, is it? When it comes to being leaders and being servants and slaves of all. But just that it works doesn't mean that we should do it. Why should we be listening to Jesus at this point? It's because of his example, isn't it? Because of what he's done. I mean, if Jesus is willing to do this for us, shouldn't we be willing to do this for others? As his disciples, as those who want to follow in his footsteps. Shouldn't we want to do this and listen to what he says? And listen to Jesus when he says, not so with you. Be a servant, be a slave, be like me is what Jesus is saying. And it's what Jesus is saying to you who are being ordained. With the possibility of assuming even greater levels of leadership. It doesn't matter what you're going to do or how gifted you are, the challenges you face or your level of responsibility. As a leader, Jesus calls those who follow him in leadership to be a servant and a slave which is the vice you'll find in the best leadership book of all. Best leadership book of all, which is God's word in the Bible, which has at its very centre the example of Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve and give up his life as a ransom for many. A ransom for many, including you and me. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the willing service and self-sacrifice of Jesus that saves us from judgment and sin. And we pray, Father, that in our desire to live for you and to serve you, we would follow in your footsteps and serve those around us. We pray, Father, that you would help us fight our natural temptation to live for ourselves and that you would so change our hearts that we would be more and more like you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You have heard, my brothers, in your private examination, in the sermon, and in the readings from Holy Scripture, how great is the dignity and importance of this office to which you are called. And now, again, I exhort you, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you remember the high dignity of this office and charge to which you are called. That is to say, to be messengers, watchmen, and stewards of the Lord, to teach and forewarn, to feed and provide for the Lord's family, to seek for Christ's sheep who are scattered abroad, and for his children who are surrounded by temptation in this world, that they may be saved through Christ forever. Have always, therefore, printed in your mind how great a treasure is committed to your care. For they are the sheep of Christ, whom he bought with his death, and for whom he shed his blood. The church and congregation whom you must serve is his bride and his body. And if it should come about that the church or any of its members is hurt or hindered as a result of your negligence, you know the greatness of the fault and the judgment that will follow. Accordingly, consider within yourselves the purpose of your ministry to the children of God and see that you never cease your labour, your care and diligence until you have done all that lies in you according to your bounden duty to bring all such as are or will be committed to your care to that understanding in the faith and knowledge of God and to that maturity in Christ, which leaves no place among you for error in religion or viciousness in life. Since your office is of such excellence and such difficulty, you can see how much care and study you need to show yourselves dutiful and thankful to the Lord who has placed you in so great a dignity and so great a responsibility. Take care, therefore, that neither you yourselves offend nor be the cause of others offending. You cannot have such a mind and will by yourselves, for that will and ability is given by God alone. Therefore, you ought to pray cease earnestly for his Holy Spirit. And because you cannot perform the difficult task of leading men and women to salvation without the doctrine and guidance of the Holy Scriptures, you should read and study them well and shape your life and the lives of those for whom you are responsible according to their teaching. And for the same reason, you should put away as much as possible all worldly preoccupations and pursuits. We have good reason to believe that you have carefully considered all these things already and that you have decided by God's grace to give yourselves wholly to this office to which God has been pleased to call you so that to the best of your ability you will devote yourselves completely to it. You will continually pray to God the Father by the mediation of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for the assistance of the Holy Spirit, so that by daily reading and meditating on the Scriptures, you may grow in your ministry, and that you may so strive to sanctify the lives of you and yours, and to shape them according to the teaching of Christ, that you may be godly patterns for the people to follow. And now, in order that this present congregation of Christ's people may also be assured of your intentions in these things, and in order that your public profession may strengthen your resolve to do your duties, 
you shall plainly answer these questions, which I, in the name of God and of his church, now put to you. Daniel, do you think in your heart that you are truly called, according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this Anglican Church of Australia, to the order and ministry of Presbyter? Alan, do you think in your heart that you are truly called according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this Anglican Church of Australia to the order and ministry of Presbyter? Roger, do you think in your heart that you are truly called according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the order of this Anglican Church of Australia to the order and ministry of Presbyter. Malcolm, do you think in your heart that you are truly called according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this Anglican Church of Australia to the order and ministry of Presbyter? Timothy, do you think in your heart that you are truly called according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this Anglican Church of Australia to the order and ministry of Presbyter. Thank you. I say to you all, are you convinced that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrine required of necessity for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And will you instruct the people committed to your care from the Scriptures and teach nothing as required of necessity to eternal salvation, except what you are convinced may be proved by the scriptures. I am convinced and will do so by God's grace. Will you always faithfully minister the doctrine and sacraments and the discipline of Christ as the Lord has commanded and as this church has received them according to the commandments of God? Will you teach the people committed to your charge to keep and observe them diligently? I will do so by the help of the Lord. Will you be ready to drive away all false and strange doctrines that are contrary to God's word, and to this end, both publicly and privately, to warn and encourage all within your care, both the sick and the well, as often as the occasion demands? Will you be diligent in prayer and in the reading of the scriptures, undertaking studies that help to a fuller knowledge of them and turning aside from the pursuit of studies for self-indulgence and worldly gain? I will do so with the Lord being my helper. Will you strive to live according to the teaching of Christ so that you and your family may be good examples to the flock of Christ? I will, for the Lord being my helper. Will you maintain and promote, to the best of your ability, quietness, peace, and love among all Christian people, especially among those who are committed to your care? I will, for the Lord being my helper. Will you reverently obey your ordinary and other chief ministers set over you in the church? gladly and willingly, following their godly counsel. I will, for the Lord being my helper. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do all these things, grant you the strength and power to perform them, that he may complete his work, which he has begun in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I now invite congregation silently to pray for these brothers who are to be ordained and in a moment we'll sing together seated and kneeling the hymn.
let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, by your infinite love and goodness, you have given us your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and the author of eternal life. After he had ascended into heaven, he sent into the world his apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers and pastors, by whose ministry he gathered together a great flock in all parts of the world to proclaim the praise of your holy name. For these great benefits, and because you have called these your servants to the same office and ministry appointed for the salvation of humanity, we give you most hearty thanks, and we praise and worship you. We humbly ask that we and all who call upon your name may be continually thankful for these and all your benefits, and that we may daily increase in the knowledge and love of you, Father, with your Son and the Holy Spirit. And we pray that through these your ministers and those whom they serve, your name may be forever glorified and your kingdom enlarged. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I invite those who are presbyters already to come and join with the bishops as we lay hands on these brothers. Thank you. Tim, receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a presbyter in the Church of God now committed to you by the laying on of our hands. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And be a faithful dispenser of the word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. take authority to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments in the congregation in which you shall be lawfully appointed to do so. Malcolm. Receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a presbyter in the Church of God, now committed to you by the laying on of our hands. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, are retained. And be a faithful dispenser of the Word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Malcolm, take authority to preach the word of God and administer the holy sacraments in the congregation in which you should be lawfully appointed to do so. Roger, receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a presbyter in the Church of God, now committed to you by the laying on of our hands. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And be a faithful dispenser of the Word of God and of his holy sacraments in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Roger, take authority to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments in the congregation in which you shall lawfully be called to do so. That one's mine. Alan, receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a presbyter in the Church of God, now committed to you by the laying on of our hands. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And be a faithful dispenser of the Word of God and of his holy sacraments in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Alan, take authority to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments in the congregation in which you shall lawfully be called to do so. Amen. Daniel, receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a presbyter in the Church of God, now committed to you by the laying on of our hands. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. And be a faithful dispenser of the Word of God and of his holy sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Daniel, take authority to preach the word of God and to administer the holy sacraments in the congregation in which you shall be lawfully appointed to do so. Amen. People of God, with joy, I present to you these brothers now admitted to the Order of Presbyter. Friends, as uh, our newly ordained presbyters return to their places, would you stand with them? And together with Christians across the globe and down through the ages, let us affirm our common faith on page 12 and together. We believe, we believe in, in one, one God, God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection.
resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. And now let's pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we're taught by your holy word to make prayers and supplications to give thanks for all people. We ask you in your mercy to receive our prayers which we offer to your divine majesty. We pray that you'll lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially your servant Charles our King, his representatives and ministers, his parliaments and all who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice and uphold integrity and truth. And we ask you of your goodness Lord to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness or any other adversity. We ask you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord. And grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers that by their life and teaching they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace and especially to this congregation here present that we may receive your word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And we also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples. That with them, we may be partakers of your eternal kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. For the Lord's Supper, our hymn focuses us on the sacrifice made once and for all by our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand and let's sing together.
brothers and sisters in Christ, we who come to receive the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ can come only because of his great love for us. For although we are completely undeserving of his love, yet in order to raise us from the darkness of death to new life as God's sons and daughters, our Saviour Christ humbled himself to share our life and to die for us on the cross. In remembrance of his death and as a pledge of his love, he has instituted this holy sacrament which we are now to share. But those who would eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord must examine themselves and amend their lives. They must come with a penitent heart and steadfast faith. Above all, they must give thanks to God for his love towards us in Jesus Christ. You then who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. Jesus said, come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, Holy Father, mighty creator and eternal God. We praise you through Jesus Christ our Lord, the true high priest who has cleansed us from sin and made us a royal priesthood called to serve you forever. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father, 
For in your tender mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and who instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, you, all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Uh, three bishops and five ordinands will serve you at four stations, two at the front, so the people here will queue single file each aisle uh, from each, on your block come forward and side aisles back. There are places to put your empty cups. People on the sides will go to the rear and uh, small modification to what's written. Uh, those of you in the centre at the back will also go to the rear when the ushers indicate that the sides have been completed. The other thing to say is that if your children accompany you, please indicate clearly whether you want them simply to just be with you or whether you've instructed them and they'll receive the elements. Thank you.
St. Paul told the elders of the church at Ephesus, take heed to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians to feed the church of the Lord which he obtained with his own blood. Let us pray, as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice, humbly asking you that all we who are partakers of this Holy Communion may be fulfilled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And although we are unworthy through our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, Father Almighty, now and for ever. Amen. Amen. Continuing in prayer. Most merciful Father, we ask you to send your blessing on these your servants, that they may be clothed with righteousness and that your word spoken through them may be of such effect that it may never be spoken in vain. Grant also that we may always have grace so to hear and receive their proclamation of your holy word, that in all our words and deeds we may seek your glory and the increase of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite those who are family of uh, the, our recently ordained uh, presbyters to stand where you are as we pray for you. <clears throat> Father in heaven, from whom every family on earth is named, we pray for the families of these presbyters. Grant them understanding and assurance as they share this ministry. Refresh them by your spirit. Give them comfort in times of hurt, energy in times of weariness, hope in times of doubt, and grace sufficient for each day. Fill them with all joy and peace in believing, through him who knows our every need, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for our diocese and the joy of serving you in our churches and organisations. We especially thank you for the ministry of Moore College and Youth Works College in training people for gospel ministry. Fill our lives with the fruit of your spirit so that we may walk in joyful obedience, share your love by word and deed, and see Christ honoured in every community as Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we praise you, Lord of all, for the gifts of Christ our ascended King, for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. We thank you for all who minister your word around the world and for the fellowship we share together in proclaiming Christ. Hear our prayer for all who do not know your love and have not heard the gospel of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Send out your light and truth through the messengers of your word. Help us all to support them by our prayers and giving, and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Uh, dear friends, um, let me thank you all very much indeed for your presence this evening. Uh, it's an occasion which I think of as one of solemn joy. Solemn because of the seriousness of the task to which these men have been committed and joy because of our confidence that God is able to work in cracked clay jars and frail vessels like all humans are to make known the excellencies of his son in whom alone is our salvation to be found. I'm so pleased that so many of you have uh, made the time available this evening to encourage uh, and to celebrate uh, as we set aside these brothers. Thank you to their families, of course, uh, who've loved them for a long time and will continue to love them into the future. Uh, to those of you who've shared with them in church life, uh, in their ministry training or in their current uh, position, or those of you who are uh, perhaps waiting to receive them uh, into ministry, uh, wherever it is along their journey of serving the Lord Jesus that has brought you here, we are so glad and grateful for your fellowship and encouragement in this way. So uh, thank you so much for being here. My thanks to Dean Sandy um, for uh, administering the cathedral for us uh, so well, and to our preacher, Bishop Koo, for bringing God's word to us in such a pertinent and powerful way. And uh, God bless you, dear brothers. Would you like to stand? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.